Awesome, everyone, welcome. It's the 10.04 that we were planning, <laughs> planning to wait for. Um, I think we have quite a few uh, who joined, uh, some other that are still um, probably waiting for us you know, to start and then <laughs> we'll just join a little bit later, that's always the case. Uh, but I would say let's get kick started. Uh, it's a packed agenda. We will be together for a couple of hours um, and I really hope that it will be an interesting, interesting time for everyone. Um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Okay. Okay, I hope you can see um, a nice uh, making Web3 infrastructure scalable and accessible PowerPoint slides. We're gonna go and, and be quite, um, quite intense uh, during this, this webinar, but at any point, um, please do, uh, do stop us and ask questions. This is a small group seminar, and that's give us the opportunity to deep dive in an interactive way. If you have any questions, do please write them uh, in the chat uh, during the presentations. And if you feel like it, do, uh, do uh, start with, you know, uh, mute yourself and ask questions directly during the Q&A sessions. Uh, this really wants to be an interactive seminar. And um, yeah, one uh, on the housekeeping side, uh, please know that we're recording this webinar and uh, that by participating, you're essentially giving us uh, you know, consent for us to be doing so as well that um, we will uh, be distributing uh, this recording afterwards through our channels. That's good because if there is any part that you want to go over again, you will be able to do so. But if you feel that there is good value, do share it with your network. Uh, we will be very happy uh, to see a community coming together for this partnership. Cool. So uh, done and over with a bit of the housekeeping that I have to do. Um, just a brief overview of the agenda for today. We will start uh, with Professor Kuzmanovic, who will talk about scalability bottleneck. And we will look at uh, defining what it is, how to solve it, and why it is important to miners, users, traders, and companies. We will then move uh, to uh, Eugene uh, Asef, who will look at accessibility of public blockchains. And there are, of course, challenges, but we will make a case for managed services, why they're useful, and what's the latest progress with the technology in this, in this area. Then, of course, the, the news uh, and why we are aggregated today here is the integration, the news of the integration between Chainstack and BlockRock. And with BlockRock together, um, I think we can, we can look at uh, an improved performance and uh, how the scalability bottleneck can actually be overcome. We will do a, a demo and there will be plenty of time for a Q&A. So uh, to get started, um, I think we want to really ask ourselves the questions, why do we really care about infrastructure? for scalability of the Web 3.0. And everyone is crazy about DeFi now. So will it last and is it sustainable? That's a big question. Infrastructure will be a key deciding factor on how, uh, how the next phase of adoption for DeFi will pan out. Both gas price and transaction speed will be critical to the viability of the, the ecosystem. And of course, this is a key area uh, for R&D and innovation. And that's what this event is about. Uh, we can really look at the cutting edge uh, in terms of uh, bringing together high performance and uh, low uh, transaction fees overall with, with what uh, we can bring about with this innovation, with this integration. So to date, the majority of the DeFi ecosystem is built on top of Ethereum. And that means that to grow the DeFi ecosystem, we have to overcome network scalability bottleneck. Uh, which comes from both performance and costs. So um, there are a few alternatives to Ethereum, for example, Matic. And to me, it will be interesting to see uh, over the coming few months whether uh, there will be a fragmentation of layer ones or a consolidation of layer ones. And with the consolidation of the layer ones, whether we will see a proliferation of uh, a number of applications built on top of layer two. So when we talk about DeFi ecosystem, what, what do we actually mean uh, by that? There are a number of applications you will have seen with the DeFi you know, coming up to the mainstream news uh, these days. Uh, it has to do with borrowing and lending. You will probably have heard about yield farming has become you know, the, the new buzzword. Today I was checking and we were kind of people that were not that excited for about 84, 85% uh, returns on yield farming, which is still exceptional, but you know, at this time the performance is so high <laughs> that we got used to, to really exceptional numbers in that sense. Um, there are decentralized exchanges, uh, structuring of derivative products, 
asset management protocols, um, decentralized insurance options, uh, prediction markets, synthetic asset bridges. There, you can get even sophisticated, really, really sophisticated on this. And all of this is based on one, uh, like one base layer, uh, which is uh, stable coins. And USDD, USDC, uh, Dai, Paxos. There are there are a few, but that also brings an interesting reflection on the infrastructure that underpins stablecoins. So the infrastructure uh, that is uh, on the uh, uh, on the um, uh, at the base for for the stablecoins not only has to be secure and robust, but it has also to be uh, high performing. So how can we hope for exponential growth? How can we hope for uh, widespread adoption if that cannot be sustained? We're looking now at a locked uh, value uh, currently in the DeFi contracts for about, uh, I think, 8 billion as of like this week, which is a lot, but we know that it's just the beginning. And compared to what is the global value of the financial markets, it's still a very small, small portion. And we can do more, of course, uh, it will grow. But as it grows, um, and it will become more intertwined with legacy financial systems and infrastructure. Um, we have to talk about uh, the, the viability of the network. And that's what, what we're going to look in detail now. So we're going to explore today, um, what is the current status of the infrastructure for DeFi? What are the barriers to scalability and how the partnership between Blockstart and Chainstack will be, and we hope so, a game changer for the entire industry. Uh, Brooke, um, would you like to take over and introduce us to the first speaker and first portion of the of the uh, of the uh, event? Uh, yes, sure. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, my name is Brooke. I'm the marketing and PR at Blockstrout Labs, and I am happy to introduce Professor Alexander Kuzmanovich, Blockstrout Labs co-founder and chief architect. Um, professor Kuzmanovich is a net neutrality expert and full professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Northwestern University, where Blockstart Labs um, was born. Uh, professor Kuzmanovich, his work includes TCP LP protocol deployed in Linux that allows bulk data transfers without compromising performance and developing DDoS countermeasures deployed by Akamai, the world's largest cloud provider, as you know. Um, he also co-founded Google's Measurement Lab initiative for monitoring global net neutrality and the National Science Foundation awarded him a NSF Career Award for his work on net neutrality. Um, so I think the best thing about having a professor on the team is that he makes uh, complicated topics pretty easy to understand. So we're lucky in that regard. Um, and just a brief introduction to Blocks Route Labs. Uh, here at Blockstrout, we're building the network infrastructure to scale Web3 by propagating blocks and transactions really fast with something called the Blockchain Distribution Network or the BDN. Um, and while fast propagation can enable blockchains to scale, it can also have other benefits like enabling DeFi traders to make more money um, and raise component scenarios like liquidations and arbitrage. Um, but during the webinar, Professor Kuzmanovich can discuss this further and discuss the implications of the BDN for blockchain participants and DeFi traders and explain how to leverage the network layer. And of course, discuss blockchain networks in a more general sense from his academic perspective and what this partnership between Chainstack and Blockstrout um, means for everyone. Thank you, Brooke. I guess I should now uh, be standing on. Let me just share my screen. First, so I go here, share. So I hope you can see all my presentation. Is that true? Yes, yeah. great. So uh, thank you everybody for coming uh, to this webinar. So Brooke said that uh, I should be able to, ex uh, to explain, to, to make complex th thing, things simple, but sometimes I can make simple things quite complicated. So I hope it's going to be the former and not the latter. Uh, so first of all, thank you all for coming. I, I can't wait for the moment when we'll all come go back to Singapore. I was there last September and I enjoyed big time. It's a, it's a super nice city. 
and I welcome everybody else from all around the world. So this thing will go away and, and uh, pretty soon we'll all be able uh, to go come and see each other the way we should and, and, and to talk about ideas and present our partnerships and so on. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, Bloxrout Labs and how we are sending transactions fast with Bloxrout's BDN. But let me give you a little bit of, a, of, a, of an overview, how we started off, what is that we built, and how then we uh, kind of uh, are using the, the system that we built for DeFi and, and basically how we came up to the partnership with Chainstack. So the big problem that we started off like three years ago was on scaling blockchains. Okay, and basically we can all agree that one of the largest problems, at least of the first generation of blockchain systems was the lack of scalability, right? And so, I mean, I hope I don't have to spend much time uh, explaining here, but basically uh, Bitcoin wa was able to send at three TPS. Ethereum now can send at 44, uh, around 40 TPS. It used to be around seven. And we were somehow responsible for pushing it a little bit further. But again, this is all still super low uh, uh, relative to where the real world is, where the mainstream systems are, uh, uh, are uh, going. And so just the classical scenario is like, hey, credit cards give you 5,000 TPS, and then just go to some very simple cases just to, uh, if everybody in US would fill their tank only once a week on, on, on a gas station, then just for that, you need 450 TPS. Okay, so we were born out of this uh, desire to scale blockchains and our proposition was quite uh, strong, I would say, that would be scale all blockchains to thousands of on-chain, uh, uh, to, to, to thousands of uh, uh, TPS uh, throughput without changing a single line of code of, uh, of the native uh, uh, blockchain code, right? So how do we do that? Well, we add something called a layer zero, which is what I will uh, uh, explain uh, down the road, basically uh, add a networking infrastructure, networking layer to help scale up the blockchains. And here are just some of our accomplishments. Here is what we accomplished in the last uh, several years. So uh, one of the things that I'm particularly proud of was a Bitcoin Cash uh, proof of concept where we were capable of pushing the TPS rate for Bitcoin Cash to more than uh, 1200 TPS in a real world setup with nodes sitting all over the world. And uh, it's a really, really distributed system with a large number of nodes. And so this was really uh, uh, the, the big issue for us. Another thing is we are working with the Ethereum mainnet. We are currently supporting more than 50% of the miners. Uh, and uh, our tests show that we can, uh, I mean, these uh, numbers are a little bit outdated. We can do even better as hopefully we will demonstrate closer to the end of this particular uh, uh, webinar. We are also working with other blockchain systems, for example, with Ontology, and we have partnerships with many, many, many existing blockchain projects. So with, uh, uh, let me then just quickly try to explain like, so what is, I mean, what is that we are doing and why what is happening currently in the blockchain at the network layer of the blockchain systems is not as efficient as we hope it can be, right? So let me go back to this peer-to-peer uh, kind of networking, right? And here throughout my presentation, I'm always talking about, I'm almost uh, exclusively talking about how you can send blocks and stuff like that. However, note that of course, our, our network sends blocks and transactions, first transactions, then blocks. And it is essential to do both, both in order to scale, but uh, uh, in addition to that, we are enabling transactions to, to make it the miners much faster, which is a particularly important feature that as I will explain here is essential for the DeFi applications and so on. So let's just take a quick example uh, shown here in the figure. So here we have a, uh, one miner, for example, in China, let's say, that just mined the block and need, wants to send this block to other peers in the network. So in Bitcoin, we have uh, each peer has approximately eight, eight, eight other peers that it's connecting to. Uh, in Ethereum, you have 25 or 50, depending on the, on the particular setup 
on the client that the node is running. But in any case, uh, uh, these other nodes in the network can be spread all over the world, right? The network is random and hence, uh, you can actually be sending data from one part of the world to the other part of the world. Now that sounds like whatever, I mean, just send it over. However, once you send this particular piece of information, is it a transaction or a block, it doesn't matter. It travels through a large number of entities that exist uh, on an end-to-end -end path. And these entities are autonomous systems or ISPs completely independently managed by different companies, right? And the bad news with networks, with the networking, is that the worst component on, on that end-to-end on -end path is the one who's gonna determine how bad things are gonna be, right? So you can have nine out of 10 of these, of these networks are doing super great and they're super fast, but only one is, 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 is really slow, while the entire end-to-end -end communication is gonna be really slow, okay? So this is, uh, one first example where things, things can go wrong when you're sending data from one part of the world to the another part of the world and as it really happens with blockchain systems. So unfortunately, this is just the first part of the problem. The second part of the problem, you just travel the first hop in a peer-to-peer -peer system, right? Because once I send piece of data to my neighbors, my neighbors have to send them to their neighbors, right? And depending on the network, it can take between five and to 10, even 15 or more hops until this particular piece of data makes it to the other part of the world, okay? And moreover, not only do you now depend 10 or 15 times on each of these particular problems that you have with end-to-end -end communication, but you're now depending on what others are doing, right? So consider these guys in the middle, they're somebody else's machines, right? These machines may not be well, uh, 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 well configured. There could be issues there. So you are now depending on what others are doing, right? So not only can networks go wrong, endpoints or miners or nodes in a blockchain system, they themselves can be, may, might not be optimal. And this is another point where things can go wrong in peer-to-peer -peer communication. So uh, we are trying to solve this problem, okay? So uh, blocks route, is deploying a thing called a blockchain distribution network, which is a kind of a new word. It comes out of a thing called a content distribution network. I hope we're all familiar with uh, uh, players such as uh, Akamai, YouTube, Google's of the world and everybody else, which is the infrastructure that helps you push data much faster uh, throughout. So what we have built is a network infrastructure that is really tailored towards blockchains. We really, are not looking how to how we can speed up video or how we can do this and that. We really are into focused on how we can help blockchains to push data much faster, which is important one for scaling, but also important for this uh, increasing DeFi application and so on. So uh, I will explain a little bit uh, later uh, what it all looks like, but in, in general, we do have two types of nodes in our system. Ones are uh, uh, things called the relays, these are high-end servers that sit on cloud infrastructure such as Google, Amazon, Alibaba, and others, which are helping us to really push that, uh, to really uh, push data faster and have uh, interconnection links uh, much better than what they are. But on top of that, we also have a so-called gateway software. Okay, gateways is a piece of software that a node, a miner or, or, or a transaction generator puts on their node which then helps, which sits close to your node and helps send data uh, between the end user and that particular relay and to everybody else in the rest of the network, okay? So we are capable of pushing data much, much faster depending on different scenarios, depending on the blockchain system and how big the blocks are and so on. It can, it can be quite faster, uh, 10 to 100 times faster. So let me, I mean, it sounds a little bit like, hey, like that's, that's too much. Let me try to explain how do we get to these numbers and what are the things that we do in the background so that we can actually achieve such performance. So the first thing is, as I said, it's essential for us to send 
to push both transactions and blocks. And in that context, I think that we are unique because before we came uh, to do this, people were thinking, aha, uh, the really important thing is to push blocks between miners because this is when forks can happen and this is how you can actually help blockchain system. But what we are doing, we are also collecting transactions from the users or from the peer-to-peer -peer system and distributing these transactions throughout our system. Why is this important? This is important because once you have that transaction distributed through our infrastructure, when a block comes, we don't really have to utilize to send because the block consists of transactions that were just uh, distributed around. Then sending a block, you don't really have to send the, uh, the block as it actually is. So what we do is when we are sending transactions, we assign it a short identifiers. Right? So, for example, if a, if a transaction is 540 bytes long, we assign it a four byte identifier. This is a completely local identifier, only used by blocks route and means nothing to anybody else in the rest of the world. Right? So, this is just a local kind of caching thing that we, once we see this transaction, we just tell everybody, hey, as, whenever you see this transaction, instead of sending the entire transaction, you can just use this small uh, identifier and it's going to be just fine. The rest of the uh, the rest of the blocks route network will be able to recognize this piece of data. Okay, so when the block comes, which consists of transactions, instead of that gateway, instead of sending the entire block, it says, "Aha! I've seen this transaction. Let me use this short identifier." So it is capable of significantly reducing the size of the blocks when they come into play. And given the ratio of the transaction to our identifier, only here we managed to, to save it more than 100x in the size of the data that we are sending once the blocks are being sent in the blockchain system. Okay. Another thing that we are, and so this is a very cool graphic and to impress you on how things are moving fast. So uh, uh, hoping that that went well, let me uh, actually tell you what happens next. Another thing that we are using both for blocks and transactions for any data that we send is a thing called streaming. So this is called cut through, it's not really block routing, it's cut through data routing. Uh, but basically, this this is an old idea. This didn't come. I mean, this has been deployed in in switches like uh, three years ago. Okay, but we are the first to the, to implement this idea in the blockchain space. So what this is doing, basically, what this is showing, is uh, the transmission of a piece of data from one node to the rest of the network. Okay, so the y axis going south is showing uh, the time. This is how the time is going. So once you put a piece of data on that wire, it, you can't immediately send it. It takes a little, uh, some time, like milliseconds to send this to the wire, okay? On top of that, because that particular node that you're sending from is not the same as the next node that needs to receive this, there is some lag there. So there is a propagation delay shown here in the middle of this picture. But the key idea here is that uh, the, the internet itself and the current networks are designed as store and forward networks, right? What that means is that you send some piece of data, it comes to the next uh, node, that node receives the entire data, looks at some headers and then figures out where to send next and then it starts sending next. So what we are doing here, we are basically, uh, uh, as soon as that middle node in this picture starts receiving data, it doesn't wait for the entire uh, uh, chunk of data to be received. As soon as it starts receiving something, this middle node starts streaming to the rest of the network, right? And this is where uh, uh, this significantly helps with, with the pro data propagation because it's not really storing forward network. It is more of a very uh, uh, carefully designed broadcast network that simply sends whatever somebody sends on one end should should as soon as possible uh, uh, reach the rest of the network. And so going back to the original uh, to the original uh, uh, picture and how we are different. So basically, what is this showing? This is showing like you had this complicated uh, 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 network where everybody is sending to their peers and their peers are sending to their peers, but then it's really very complicated. In our case, what we have is a node that sends uh, a much smaller chunks of data when the blocks are uh, uh, there, 
uh, uh, when we're talking about blocks. And then it sends this to a nearby blocks route relay. So the, uh, the, uh, uh, the path between that endpoint and the blocks route is really short, right? Because we have a large number currently between 15 and 20 servers uh, around the world. And then within the blocks route, we propagate data fast as I just explained. And then at the other endpoint, we send this to everybody else in the network so quickly. So instead of having a large number of places where things can go slow and, 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 and not optimal, we really cut this complicated communication into very, three very simple pieces, each of which is, has a really high throughput and has a low latency and can really make it uh, fast to the, uh, to the rest of the network. So uh, here is, here is, what uh here is the picture of the, the entire blockchain picture and here is what our network looks like and here is where the users are so here is where i will i, I will introduce our different apis different ways in which users can send transactions to our network and so then later on we will discuss how it all works so at the bottom here you have the blockchain uh, a blockchain peer-to-peer -peer network right so just consider a ethereum network consisting of like 10 20 000 nodes this is happening in the middle uh, uh this is happening at the bottom in the middle you have end users who currently are so, uh, some of them of course majority of them are using the the uh, this blockchain peer-to-peer -peer network and then in the middle i'm showing how users can connect to the block route network which is showing on the top right so the key reason why i'm showing this these networks at different uh, at different positions is just to clarify on how you can access blocks route otherwise blocks route is intermingled it is really very well connected to the peer-to-peer -peer network and so on okay so let's just take a look at the uh, at the top picture this is uh, what blocks route looks like so, so, uh, so uh, what it consists of of block relays these are high-end uh, nodes that sits on Google, Amazon, Alibaba's and other uh, cloud networks that are uh, used for sending blocks uh, through the network. Then we have transaction relays. These are high -end nodes used uh, to help users send transactions through the network, fast. And on, to on top of that, we have cloud APIs. These are newly added uh, high-end nodes that help end users send transactions directly through blocks out, even if they have no gateways, don't know any other, any other uh, uh, blocks route systems uh, co uh, uh, connected, uh, uh, placed on their endpoints. Okay. And so here, uh, here we're, uh, let me just explain how a user can actually connect to blocks out. So the first way is using a node. So you, you have a blockchain node uh, uh, that the user is using anyway, so uh, in this case, the, uh, the users connects to a gateway, installs a gateway on the premises where the blockchain node is, right? However, nothing changes in the way that the user is sending data, right? In this particular setup, right? So what that means is that the user simply continues sending data to its local node. This local node then is connected to a gateway, which to that blockchain node looks just like another peer. Right? Because the communication between this blockchain node and our gateway is completely Ethereum compatible. It is like, uh, it looks just like any other, uh, connecting to any other node in Ethereum, right? So in this particular case, the user just, uh, just utilize this node and then one, because given that in, this node is connected to a gateway that sits on that same machine, that trans, whatever transaction is sent to the gateway is then sent to the, uh, I'm sorry, whichever transaction is sent to the node is then immediately sent to the gateway and then propagated through the blockchain's BDN, uh, to the blocks routes BDN. Fine, but we figured out, like, listen, you are the user, the blockchain node, the gateway, they're all sitting on the same place, on the same machine. Uh, it may be useful for the user to be able to directly send to the gateway that sits on that particular that particular node. So that's the second way that you can that the user can use it. Send immediately to, to, to the gateway. The gateway will then send this directly to blocks route and the blockchain node will, uh, will get in sync because either the user or the gateway will anyway send this to the local local blockchain node. Right? So this is a, sh a little shortcut that still have helps uh, uh, increase the speed 
uh, because it's 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 faster to send the transaction directly to the gateway, even if it sits on the same machine. Right? Every millisecond counts, as I'm going to explain later. So this is what we are trying to do. Here, uh, uh, what I'm showing here. And another way is listen. There are users who really don't want to mess with blockchain nodes. Uh, it's complicated to set them up, and they don't really want to do this. They want to be capable of sending transactions directly from their endpoint software from their wallet or whatever they're using directly to blocks out without without uh, going through any intermediate mode so for that we have a cloud api cloud api connects you directly to that particular to, to the blocks out infrastructure and you directly send the transactions to the to our server uh, which then uh, transmits that to the rest of the of the system and this is and this is also uh, very efficient so in addition to these three APIs, we also have uh, other APIs. Some already exist and some are into working. So let me just quickly explain what they are. So in addition to this, to sending transactions faster, you're keeping, uh, uh, you can also su subscribe to a transaction streaming service. What that means is that you, uh, because Blockslout is sending all these transactions through the, uh, 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 getting them from uh, from everybody in the system and pushing them to the miners, well, we have a stream that uh, lets a user listen to these transactions even before they reach the miners. You you are capable of figuring out what's happening, uh, which transactions are coming up. Okay, and this is actually very useful as I will explain. Uh, in the next few slides, because that helps the end users to kind of, aha, somebody else wants to buy this thing. So if I do something, if I can act quickly, then I might be able to utilize some opportunities and so on. I'm not going to dive into details of DeFi because I'm sure you guys know about that much more. And on top of that, another, another uh, API that we are working on is uh, the, the, the probability that your transaction is going to make to the next block. So basically because we are uh, capable of observing what is happening in real time with blocks and transactions, if you send a transaction and pay a particular fee, we all know that the fees are uh, very high these days. What we can help you with is in real time, you can, ask, you can ask us, so what is the probability that this fee is gonna make it in the next block? Because I really care that this makes it in the next block. And we are gonna tell you like, hey, it's 95, hey, it's 55, hey, it's 10%. And this might help you understand if you wanna boost up and speed up that particular transaction in real time so that it can make it to the next block or you wanna wait or you maybe paid the right fee so you don't have to change anything. So this again goes back to the DeFi users, those who care about when the transaction is actually make, uh, made in the block and, uh, and so on. So this feature is still not out there, but it is coming. So in case you, you uh, join uh, us through Ch Chainstack, as soon as anything becomes available, you get access to that. So it's, it's, it's like, uh, it, 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 I, I think it, it's a pretty good feature. So I talked a lot and we're gonna have, uh, 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 we're going to have a, uh, a demo at the end showing like in real time, I, ho I hope things are going to go well and we will be able to show how much uh, we are better than the uh, uh, peer-to-peer -peer network. But this is just showing, you can go to our bdnexplorer.com, which is in real time showing uh, for every block and every transaction, how do we compare to, uh, 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 how our propagation is faster for, uh, than that of peer-to-peer -peer network. You can dive into each transaction, figure out what's going on and so on. And this is showing, this is a snippet showing uh, a result for uh, blocks and transactions. Of course, the larger the number, the better off we are. And so this is showing that we are, uh, how fast are we moving a transaction through the system. And finally, and I hope I'm doing well with time. Can somebody tell me how am I doing with time? Because I don't wanna, I don't wanna overstep or something uh, else. Brooke, uh, uh, Alex, are we, uh, am, am I on time? On time, perfectly. <laughs> okay, perfectly. Uh, well, you don't know how much more I want to talk, so uh, I'm not sure if it's perfect, but yes. So I'm moving next to this, to, to explaining uh, how, uh, why 
speed matters in, in DeFi and basically how, uh, I mean, uh, 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 wide, uh, uh, where we are relative to the traditional finance. As Alex correctly said, we are only at the beginning of, of, of the DeFi revolution and we hope to grab as much piece of cake as we can from the traditional finance. But so I want to compare a little bit and explain how did we end up uh, going into this space and what is going on. So in traditional finance, I mean, we can talk as much as we want uh, against them that they are centralized this and that, but they are, of course, they've been around for some number of decades and they perfected their game uh, quite well, right? So uh, the issue with finance is that it's, it's, it's a winner takes all thing, right? If I wanna buy something from somebody and if that somebody can sell me only one piece of that, then whoever comes first to that piece of the, uh, of the thing that I wanna buy is going to buy. There's nobody else. Everybody else cannot buy that one thing, right? That's, that, that's winner takes all kind of mentality that exists realistically in this particular set. So, Traditional finance has known about this and it's been around for, for decades. And so, as you may know, uh, uh, New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ are allowing traders to place their equipment, their physical equipment close to the, to, uh, to the premises where the actual uh, 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 trading is happening because the closer you are, the sooner you can send those uh, uh, trades and, uh, and the more successful you can be. On top of that, uh, uh, there are hardware manufacturers that are talking about nanosecond time scale turnaround. So whatever you do, you do some computation, but the hardware there is designed that it doesn't, uh, that it makes things happen in nanoseconds, which is fascinating. I mean, but this is, this is telling you how, how much the speed matters and how, uh, how people actually uh, value that. And then of course, in the traditional finals, there are these uh, low latency network infrastructures. And I'm not gonna dive into details here, but basically the, uh, 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 every millisecond or microsecond that you can save can actually uh, uh, pay off in, uh, significantly because, uh, because uh, of the space where we are. And basically what, uh, while our mission is still remains to be of scaling up blockchains, well, to scale up blockchains, we build network infrastructure and that net network infra infrastructure provides, provides uh, 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 s speeds up the data uh, uh, that is being sent in that blockchain system. While in that context, we, we can provide services to the DeFi world in the same way that these guys are trying to, uh, are providing services to the tra traditional finance. Okay, so here is the summary of like, so I mean, why does it matter to send a transaction faster or why does it matter to receive faster? I will quickly go through this. So uh, like sending transaction faster, which is something that I'm gonna actually dive in uh, in the next couple of slides. Well, you're more likely to, to, to win a race protocols. This, if your transaction is gonna, if, if, if you learn about an opportunity and then we all act in the same, uh, at the same time. Yet if, if your transaction is, comes to the miners sooner than the others are gonna come, uh, well, then you're more likely to make, to make uh, that uh, opportunity. And I will actually uh, have a simple model to quantify this in the case of Uniswap, uh, which is coming next. Of course, capture arbitrage opportunity, increase the chances of, uh, of being mined in the next block, which is essential or increase one's chances of, of, of beating fee congestion. So when there is fee congestion, you really want to know what is going on with that in that mempool because you can optimize your fees. And then of course, hearing about transaction is something that, that is nat naturally essential because the sooner you hear, the sooner you can act upon that information that is, uh, that is going on. Uh, you can uh, uh, quickly identify the, uh, new liquidation or arbitrage opportunities and uh, manage risks and I mean uh, uh, it's, it's obvious that hearing about transactions is, is, is uh, as essential as reacting upon them because it's the same cycle right you are uh, if you hear sooner you're going to act sooner but then when you send sooner and the network is faster then you really are going to be super competitive relative to others so 
This all sounds uh, intuitive and logical, but then uh, we discussed internally and we said, okay, that's all fine, but can we put some numbers on this? Can we actually quantify like in real terms, how much do you actually gain uh, 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 using this approach? So here is a simple model that talks about Uniswap. Uniswap is turning around a huge amounts of money. The last time I looked, it was close to $300 million a day, V2 only. And I was like, dude, this is too much money going around, but that's, that's where we are in this space. And it's, I mean, real, real stuff. So it's a distributed exchange. They, uh, I'm not gonna dive into details how it works because again, you guys know much more about this. I'm just gonna walk you through how users use it and what gains you can get by utilizing this feature that is now coming on Chainstack through, uh, via Bloxrow. So uh, here you have a, a, a Uniswap website. You just go to their web page and you choose a, a, a pair to, that you wanna transact on and say, hey, I wanna exchange this amount of a coin for, a, for something else, right? And so you just put in some numbers. Once you do that, you click that particular web page then uh, your wallet uh, associated with this particular application is, is going to uh, ask you like, hey, you really want to exchange this? Well, you tell me from which account do you want to do this and so on. And eventually you're going to create a transaction and that transactions go, a transaction goes to the uh, Ethereum network that we just discussed all around. So it can go through Blocks route or without Blocks route. In any case, it goes out there and then it goes and it executes on a smart contract that lives on miners, all right? Uh, I mean, these smart contracts are pieces of code that live on miners. And so basically once you say, hey, I wanna exchange this much money for something else, some contract is executed there, it's either successful or unsuccessful. And then you just, uh, uh, hopefully it's successful and then you just uh, uh, do that thing. So. Well, uh, this simple model is trying to quantify, so how much do you actually gain by using blocks well, okay? So the model here is showing you know, on time, T1 is a very critical moment here. It is showing a deadline for the mining pool to, to decide on the context of the next, next block, right? So mining pools are collecting transactions from everybody from the rest of the world. And they are, of course, they are pushing those transactions that pay the highest fees, they put them on the top. And then once they, uh, once they fill in the block, they stop at some point, right? But it's not known ahead of time who's gonna mine that block, right? So once all these transactions are placed in that particular uh, block, each of the mining pools creates a template, but at some point there must be a deadline for this template to be to be finished and they have to send this to the miners so the miners can actually start mining and, and actually uh, uh, they try to win this particular block. So if a transaction reaches the mining pool before this deadline, then there is a hope, there is a chance it will get if the fee of course is high now. So what this is showing is the latency of, of blocks route and the latency of peer-to-peer. -peer. Hopefully, as we will show, the latency of blocks route is, show, is smaller than that of peer-to-peer. -peer. And another important, uh, uh, another important uh, parameter here is the interblock time. How much time is it between these critical periods? How much is in between blocks? So what this is showing, assume your transactions, your transaction comes, uh, uh, you, your transaction is transaction number one. It is generated in this period be, uh, 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 after the previous block was mined, but uh, before this critical delta period, right? So what this is, if, if a transaction is generated here, then either independently, if you use blocks route or you don't use blocks route, that transaction will make it to the next block anyways. So blocks route doesn't help you in this particular case. However, if the transaction is in between these two, uh, these two point, data points, uh, then if you use blocks route, that transaction will make it to the mining pool before the critical time. But if you use peer-to-peer, -peer, it's not gonna make, it's gonna be late. So you're, not go you're gonna waste this opportunity here, okay? And then finally, if, if, if you send transaction three that comes too late, then blocks route doesn't help here and peer-to-peer -peer doesn't help here because it's gonna come late. It's not gonna make it to next block for sure, okay? 
So what we wanted to do is to quantify how often does it happen that blocks out actually helps you. Okay, so for that, we took the interblock times. This is what that looks like. On the x-axis, you have seconds. And then on the y-axis, you have the histogram, like, hey, how often does it happen? As you can see, some blocks can come really pretty close to each other. They can come pretty far away from each other. But putting all these things together, this is giving you uh, the probability that blocks out helps, right? So uh, currently our, our uh, results show that if that we help in between 150 and 900 milliseconds, okay, 900 milliseconds, we beat the peer-to-peer -peer network, right? If you, of, of, uh, I'm not diving here into the, the details of the model, but basically it is showing that it is, it, it is very moderate. It assumes like 10% of the users are, uh, are actually using uh, a blocks route. So, so it's, it's, it's a very moderate system. Only for five, 50 milliseconds, the amount of, of, uh, 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 the amount of money that you're gonna, that these users are gonna save on, on Unisfap exclusively is $34 million a year. And if you put it to 900 milliseconds, well, multiply this by 15 times, and this is another, uh, another, uh, this is basically quantifying this in, in uh, going from milliseconds to dollars, right? So, and a similar thing applies to any other DeFi uh, uh, trading opportunity that is contested. So as long as there are different users trying to do this, well, you're helping yourself in, for example, for 900 milliseconds, it comes to 12% of cases. In 12% of cases, you're gonna win thanks to blocks route, which then you can multiply how much are you doing uh, over a particular period of time. Uh, but this is, for traders, this is, uh, this is huge. So here is where I would stop. I would like to summarize uh, where I was going. I hopefully explained uh, what blocks route does and, and what it looks like. And basically it is a content distribution network for blockchains. Our mission is to scale blockchains, but while doing that, uh, we live in the real world and we figured out that we can actually significantly help the DeFi world. And uh, basically uh, uh, we can provide low latency services. And uh, this uh, webinar, is, is aimed to, to help you understand that uh, you'll be able to utilize our services through uh, Chainstack, our partner, and we look forward to, to working with them. And in case you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to help now or later, however the schedule goes. So uh, this is where I would stop. Awesome. Th thank you so much, uh, Professor Kuzipanovic. I think it was very, intense. Uh, our brains are uh, definitely fulfilled, filled definitely. <laughs> there is a lot to, to uh, think about and I'm pretty sure that um, many through the recording will have an opportunity to go over more in detail on anything. I hope uh, that, that was a compliment. <laughs> definitely, 100%, from me at least. <laughs> it's always nice to have, to have food for thoughts and, and learn new, new things uh, going forward. And by the way, if there are any questions, please shout out um, on the chat. You can just uh, drop a note um, and maybe later on <clears throat> during the, the final Q&A. If anything was missed, then we can, we can add um, on, on any doubt. That's great. So without further ado, uh, we can move on to the next speaker and- uh, I'm trying to stop sharing. Did I do that or not yet? Don't worry, someone needs to take oh, over, okay. which I think okay, it's perfect. happening now. <laughs> there you go. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Yes. So as a brief introduction uh, to Eugene, Eugene is CTO and co-founder of Chainstack. And uh, he's coming from a, both an engineering and cybersecurity and research backgrounds. He has more than 10 years experience in leading teams uh, on R&D. In particular, um, he was VP of engineering at Acronis. So uh, he's led uh, international teams. He has you know, deep roots in enterprise development and understand um, a, a number of aspects that has to do with, uh, with uh, developing products um, for, for enterprises. Uh, he was uh, contributing and led the development of Acronis Active Protection and Acronis Notary. He also spearheaded security research team at GeoEdge, 
and headed uh, the anti-malware team in a leading cybersecurity company. Um, he is very, he's authored various publications. You can find a, a number of his blog posts uh, on our Chainstack blog. And he's done a number of uh, public engagements uh, opportunity. Um, many will come uh, in the future as well. So keep checking on our website uh, to get the latest uh, opportunities to, to hear uh, from, from Eugene. Uh, Eugene, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alexander. It was a great uh, um, uh, presentation uh, around uh, scalability. Um, and if you guys are wondering what's the, what's the AWS in the world of uh, blockchains when um, Blocks route is Cloudflare. Uh, so the answer is obvious. The AWS in the world of blockchain is Chainstack. So um, uh, what is uh, Chainstack and what we're doing for the last couple of years? Um, so we basically manage blockchain uh, services uh, that help developers and enterprises to launch and scale their uh, blockchain networks. Uh, we support both uh, public blockchains like uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And that's primarily where we work with uh, Blockstrap today. And we also support um, other uh, protocols that are consortium protocols like Hyperledger Fabric um, and, uh, and Quora and Quorum and others. So we are uh, supporting all, um, all leading uh, protocols uh, that allow people to build on, on blockchains today. Uh, we're also multi-cloud and we can uh, launch these uh, networks and nodes in various um, uh, hosting providers and also on premises. So that's also some of our key, uh, key features that we provide to our customers. Um, so what's the value of uh, managed blockchain services, uh, if you uh, ask? Um, and basically, it's uh, quite the same as the value of cloud uh, providers when they were introduced after everybody were building on their own hardware. Uh, so basically, you get uh, entire uh, management um, of all this infrastructure waived from your uh, engineers. And basically, you can spend time on building applications and spend time on uh, doing the actual uh, work that you need to do instead of um, dealing with, uh, with hardware, um, all the requirements for the software that you're running and scaling it and uh, choosing the location to deploy and so on and so forth. So uh, we bring the same experience, uh, which is very seamless and easy uh, for, uh, for the blockchain world. Uh, let's talk uh, and dive a little bit into the, um, the architecture of, uh, of uh, Ethereum nodes and uh, why it's nice and why it's good to have an Ethereum node up and running and uh, why it's also uh, complicated and how Bloxroute helps us uh, together with uh, our other technology called Bolt to uh, make this uh, seamless experience possible. Uh, so Ethereum nodes um, are the first point of contact between um, the, the blockchain and the user, basically. If you're a miner or developer, uh, you need to talk to some um, a blockchain node in order to uh, get the transactions, in order to get the blocks, in order to get the logs, uh, in order to send transactions um, to the network as well, in order to interact with smart contracts. Uh, so the blockchain node is a core component of any blockchain network because it stores um, the actual blockchain. Uh, for majority of public protocols, it stores in its entirety. So uh, uh, the, uh, the node is uh, storing the entire blockchain. Uh, so the requirements for the blockchain, if it's used heavily, it's, it's uh, quite high uh, for a node. And uh, you actually need to invest a lot into resources if you want to run your own node. Um, so why it's, why it's good, why it's cool to have uh, your own Ethereum node or to launch a dedicated Ethereum node on Chainstack, for instance, um, because it allows you to contribute to this, uh, to this network, which uh, currently comprises of a few thousands of, of nodes around the globe. Um, it also gives you uh, ability to send uh, unlimited API calls to the network so that basically you are limited only by, um, by the gas fees and te te technically you are not limited by anything else. Uh, this approach is trustless because if you have your own node, then you don't need to um, trust uh, uh, some sort of provider um, that uh, proxies your request to the node. So you just talk directly to the node, you talk directly to the blockchain. If you have a node running in, um, uh, at home or close to your um, location, uh, then you get low latency, which is good for all these um, use cases that uh, uh, Professor Alexander mentioned when you need to send transactions quickly and they need to be distributed quickly. So latency is important here. Now uh, you also contribute to the, to the network um, um, decentralization, obviously, 
and you increase the resilience of the overall blockchain network. There are a few uh, sync nodes for uh, Ethereum nodes that are interesting um, and that are used for different use cases. So the most uh, traditional one is full sync, uh, which stores the entire blockchain on the disk and uh, it can serve it on basically on any request to the node, like the content of the block or content of the transaction. It also participates in the um, uh, block validation uh, and verifies all the blocks and states. So basically this, uh, this uh, mode is usually used in, uh, in, in, in mining uh, because this, uh, this node is, is used for, for block um, uh, verification and uh, for mining new blocks. Uh, there's another sync mode, which is much lighter. That's why it's called light mode. Uh, it just stores the header uh, of the chain and then everything else is, is, uh, uh, is, 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 is getting to you by uh, demand and getting to the node by demand. It queries the um, data only when it's uh, requested. It doesn't do any verification of the blocks and usually it's used for low capacity devices. Um, so it's uh, more like a, a API gateway to the node rather than a node. Uh, because it does some very basic basic things. Um, there is a, one more interesting uh, mode, which is called archive. Uh, so it stores everything, including all the state changes. So uh, there is a, a quite unique use case for this node, which uh, has been quite popular recently because of the depth of all these protocols that are implementing, let's say, decentralized exchanges. So basically, uh, um, and, and like, uh, and swaps and, um, and, and uh, other uh, financial primitives that are being implemented currently um, in, in, in the DeFi space. Um, so because all the balances of the accounts are not directly located in the accounts, you might need to get to the um, deepest um, uh, depth of the protocol, it means you might need to see the um, uh, account, uh, not only account balances, but also smart contract balances and also the transfer of states between the smart contracts and not just accounts. So in order to do this effectively, you need to get access to all information in the blockchain, uh, including all the state changes. So for instance, uh, what you can do with archive node is at any point of time, you can uh, basically of the uh, blockchain network existence, you can query the uh, state of any account, state of any smart contract uh, in, this, um, uh, in this time. Um, and it will be served to you immediately because the node is actually storing all this information all the time. So it's uh, very widely used uh, in services such as block explorers, uh, wallets, uh, blockchain analytics. Uh, most recently, it's uh, being very well known in the protocols that are doing indexing of the chain. So for instance, the pro uh, a protocol called the graph is using archive nodes actively uh, because it needs to index all the um, all the uh, the apps, all the all the pro all the layer two protocols, um, in order to get the um, the, the results of, of the queries for um, for the users. Um, so, what's the process of running an Ethereum node? It might look straightforward. You just execute a blockchain client. The blockchain client will download the blockchain, and then you just interact with this client, right? Uh, the problem here is uh, the, the the first problem is that it takes. Uh, quite significant time to sync the node. Basically, if you want to run a full node that is uh, uh, properly verifying all the blocks and, and participating in consensus, you need to spend at least a few days. Um, and there is this fast sync mode that is available for Ethereum, uh, which does um, uh, opti optimized way of uh, syncing of the node and then switches to full node. In terms of archive node, it's always um, uh, full plus uh, all the uh, garbage collection uh, uh, enabled. Um, so you basically can spend a few months syncing this node and uh, the size of the, uh, the ledgers I will share a bit later. So that's the challenge number one. Um, if you take a look at the size of the ledger of, uh, of Ethereum node, you can see that uh, as of uh, yesterday, uh, the size of the, uh, the main net for Ethereum, um, the ledger was around uh, half a terabyte. Uh, which is quite significant because you also need to uh, run all these nodes on SSD. Outside of SSD, they just don't work because they don't sync uh, because they're very IO intensive. Um, for archive node, it's even more interesting. It's above five terabytes. So if you want to run a, an archive node um, and you want to sync it and not just run it, 
uh, you need to have at least uh, five plus terabyte SSD disks, um, ideally something of, like uh, an MBE, uh, because uh, then it will give you a, a better, better performance. But no way you can um, sync an archive node on a traditional hardware like HDDs. Um, and I'm not even talking about CPU and RAM requirements, which are also quite significant because of the processing happening on, on these kind of nodes. Um, so basically, there are some other um, challenges apart from just uh, initial sync. Um, so there are some bugs still uh, because the, uh, all, all these blockchain protocols are quite uh, in their infancy today still, so they're not really mature. Um, uh, they are somehow battle tested, but not completely. So um, you can see that there are all sorts of uh, issues um, appearing in, in, the, in the GitHub repos uh, since all the software is open source. Um, you need to do uh, maintenance all the time. So um, uh, some clients are also uh, might be more stable than others. Um, so in Ethereum, for instance, there are uh, two major clients, which is um, uh, Geth and Open uh, Ethereum. And in some cases, let's say when we started our blockchain uh, development in, in uh, one of my previous companies a few years ago, we were switching between two clients all the time because at some point one client was buggy and one was good and uh, it was uh, it was different situation in, in some other times. And um, there is also the syncing issue that I mentioned and it's not only related to the initial sync of all this uh, gigabytes or terabytes, but also it needs to catch up all the time. Um, and sometimes it's an issue because um, there is a, a conflict of interest between um, the um, resources that are spent for serving the requests and syncing the node. Because as you understand, the node is actually doing multiple things at the same time. It's uh, not just giving you access to the blockchain, but it's also trying to catch up with the, with the blockchain and also doing uh, a lot of different things, um, which are not relevant to these two processes. Uh, but the, the point is that there is always conflict of interest for resources of the node and sometimes it can uh, go out of sync and um, and you just you just don't know what to do with it. So um, these are some of the challenges that you you can face when you're running in Ethereum node. Uh, also quite interesting uh, chart about uh, block progression during the node sync. If you see that uh, initially it's very very um, uh, it's very very uh, quickly. Um, it's getting to the uh, few hundreds um, hundreds of thousands of uh, blocks very quickly, but then it's it's becoming really, really slow. Uh, the reason to that is uh, the first blocks are almost all empty. So it takes no time to sync all these blocks because they have no data, there's nothing to verify. And then later on you have uh, blocks with, with uh, uh, significant amounts of data and uh, then it takes a lot of time to process and, and to, um, uh, to get to the point when, when you're uh, in sync. So that's another interesting uh, um, thing about uh, the syncing process that it takes no time to sync an empty block, but at the same time, it takes quite significant time to sync a, a heavy block with a lot of transactions inside. So these are some of the examples of um, issues that uh, people report to, uh, to Ethereum clients. So here you see uh, Geth, uh, which is Go Ethereum uh, implementation. Uh, and you see that there are quite a lot of issues open with the, uh, with the word sync in it. Um, there's the same with uh, uh, Open Ethereum that was uh, previously parity. You, you have a hundred of um, issues which are related to sync. So it's quite a big issue um, for, for people who are running nodes. So um, as I mentioned, there are two um, issues with sync. First is this initial sync process, which can take uh, days or months. And uh, to solve this problem, we, uh, in, uh, we, we created a technology called Bolt, uh, uh, which uh, gives you an instant sync, instantly sync node uh, once you deploy one, basically. So uh, there is some magic happening in the background, uh, and there is some uh, heavy lifting happening in the background. But basically, the idea is that when you uh, create a new dedicated node, um, and this technology is uh, built in into Chainstack platform, then you don't have to wait until this node uh, is syncing for days or months. You instantly get a fully synced node. So uh, regardless of the type of the node, it can be a testnet, it can be mainnet. Uh, even if it's an archive node, 
you get an instantly synced archive node, which otherwise you would spend a few months to sync. So that's that's big. Um, and then the second uh, problem is basically catching up with the blockchain all the time. So that's where uh, Blocks Route comes in. And uh, uh, this is the actual real chart that we uh, generated a couple of days ago. Um, and we, we've conducted an experiment and we have a, a few nodes running uh, on mainnet. And um, this node needs, uh, each, of this, uh, each of these nodes, they need to sync last uh, two, um, two and a half uh, thousands of blocks. Which is which is not a lot. Which is just a few thousands of blocks. They usually synced uh, pretty quickly, and then we just measure time to get to the state when we are uh, catched up uh, with different scenarios. So basically, one node was uh, was not running a blockchain gateway uh, together with the node. Uh, one node was was running blockchain gateway, and it was just as similar to other peers. And then the third node was running just uh, blocks our gateway as, as the only peer. Now, so as you see, we saved five minutes of sync time uh, if we're just have using the, the, the BDN to get the latest blocks, to, uh, to get the latest transactions. And in other scenarios, um, you basically have um, a five minute disadvantage if you don't use uh, blocks our gateway. So that's basically the, uh, the killer feature for us uh, for integration with the blocks route for now. And it's already live and kicking. So anytime you deploy a dedicated Ethereum node on Chainstack, you get blocks route uh, completely um, uh, free of charge, and it will improve the the syncing time um, over when you're running the nodes um, um, uh, continuously significantly. So you can see that uh, that the, the, this difference is, is quite significant. And this is just the first step of uh, of our integration with, with blocks route because. As uh, Professor Kuzmanovich mentioned, um, we are uh, going to integrate uh, deeper with uh, the functionality such as sending transactions, uh, because now we're talking only about the fact that uh, Ethereum nodes on Chainstack, they can get blocks and transactions uh, much faster than before, because they're getting them directly um, from the BDN. Uh, but the next step for us is to actually allow our customers transactions to the network uh, so that uh, it's also much faster because and now they can send it only through the blockchain node uh, that will distribute the transactions through the BDN uh, in its own way. But there is also a faster way to send transactions directly to the, to the BDN. And that's something that we are working on right now um, to provide to our customers as well. Uh, so to summarize, uh, why would you choose a, um, a managed service uh, uh, provider like Chainstack for running of your nodes? Uh, basically, you don't need to think about the infrastructure uh, at all. You just launch a node and you forget about it. You insert an endpoint in your application and then it's, it's ju it just works. Um, so we have different types of offerings for uh, public blockchains and Ethereum in particular. You can run a free shared node uh, forever and it will be just some gateway for you to, to do some development testing and you don't need to commit to pay anything. Uh, and we also support dedicated nodes. Uh, um, and, and as I mentioned, for each dedicated node, we have a block start gateway enabled as well, uh, which will give you top performance. Uh, and uh, if you need some uh, really high uh, volume uh, on your Ethereum node, um, you usually use a dedicated node. And, and last but not least, we are ready to build with all the uh, tools and, um, and frameworks. So we have extensive documentation on how to build on top of um, a chain stack. Uh, we are very developer uh, oriented, so we, we build a lot of tutorials, we do a lot of uh, webinars uh, like this one, but with more uh, practical um, um, uh, side. So we do a lot of um, um, real, real life examples also on uh, what you can build um, on, on the blockchain as well and so on. So uh, this adds a few, a few things uh, about uh, why, why would you use uh, Chainstack instead of uh, writing your own node or um, or using some 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 other way of uh, interacting with the blockchain. Um, so on this, we're gonna uh, we're gonna switch to the demo, right? Yes, uh, Brooke. Yes. Uh, now we will um, watch a demo from Carlo Zhu, one of our top software engineers here at Blockstrout Labs. Carlo, will you share your screen? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, 
Hi, uh, can you guys see it? Uh, okay. So next, I'm going to do a demo to show the speed of Chainstack powered by Blockshot. We are going to send some transactions and then compare the transaction propagation time between using Blockshot and without using Blockshot. And if everything goes well, we can see a big time difference between those two. And firstly, let's do a quick overview of today's, uh, firstly, let's do a quick overview of today's uh, test environment. We will be using Ethereum Robson network and Blockshot testnet. Because for Blockshot, we do not support Robson in our production environment. And so we have an internal testnet, which is just a duplicate of our production environment. And we are going to generate and send 20 pairs of transactions. For the two transactions in each transaction pair, one of them will be sent to Chainstack Ethereum node, and the other one will be sent to Chainstack with Blockshot Gateway. So the first one here can be visualized as Chainstack without Blockshot, and the second one will be Chainstack with Blockshot. And then we'll run some scripts to compare the transaction propagation time. And this page has a flow chart of our experiments today. There is a transaction generator that will generate and send transactions to the Ethereum network. It uses E send raw transaction API call to send transaction to Chainstack without block shot. And it uses BLXRTX API call to send transaction to Chainstack with block shot. And then those transactions will be propagated to the entire Ethereum network, which consists of thousands of Ethereum nodes. And then we'll monitor the transaction propagation time in three different regions, North America, Europe, and Asia. For each region, we have an instance that hosts Ethereum node and Blockstar gateway. And then we'll use those three instances to do the propagation time comparison. One more thing I'd like to mention before we start the demo is the 20 transaction pairs. And here, let's take transaction pair number one as an example. Let's say that in transaction pair number one, the transaction that will be sent to Chainstack without block route is transaction 1C, C as in Chainstack. And the transaction that will be sent to Chainstack with block route is transaction 1B, B as in block route. And transaction 1C has a gas price of 6.01, while transaction 1B has a gas price of 5.01. Similarly, we can construct the other uh, transaction pairs in the same way. And the gas price value is crucial to our test today because we use the gas price to match the transactions in the transaction pairs. So for example, let's say that uh, the Ethereum node in Asia receives a transaction with gas price 5.02. In that case, it knows that this transaction is in transaction pair number two and uh, it is from Chainstack with block shots. And in that case, the propagation route of that transaction will be from transaction generator to Chainstack with block shots, and then to the Ethereum network. And finally, it arrives at the node in Asia. So this is a brief explanation of our test environment today. And uh, now let's do the demo. So as we can see on the left hand side, there are three different windows that represent three instances in different regions. The host name here shows that the first one is the instance in the United States, which is the North America region. And the second one is in the Europe region. And the last one is in the Asia Pacific region, which are the three regions that we mentioned in that flowchart. And now if we do a sudo docker ps command, it shows all the running dock containers on those instances. And let's use the first window here as an example. It has three containers running. The first one is the Blockshot BX gateway. And the second one is the Ethereum client, which is the Robson Ethereum node. And the last one is the ETH logger, which is something that we use to monitor the gateway performance internally that can be safely ignored in the demo today. 
And then we will be using a script called compare TX propagation to monitor the transaction propagation time. And this script has several different input arguments. And the first argument is the sender's Ethereum wallet address. And then the next argument is the gas price of the transactions. As I just mentioned, block drop transactions have a gas price between five and six, and non-block drop transactions have a gas price between six and seven. And the number of transaction pairs we are going to generate is 20. And on the right, we are going to run a script called start txgen that generates and sends transactions to the Ethereum network. And now at first, let's uh, run the script on the left. As we can see, the connection established successfully for all of them. And then we'll generate, some, uh, generate and send some transactions on the right. So, this, so it may take about 30 seconds to one minute for this script to finish. And as we can see, it prints out some useful information on the screen. Like, so for example, we can use uh, transaction pair number 17 here as the example. The first transaction, the transaction sent to Chainstack with block route. And the second transaction is a transaction sent to Chainstack with the whole block route. And it has information like sender, receiver, and amount and gas price. And a very interesting number here is the timestamp. As we can see, for the time we sent the request, there's only like a one millisecond time difference between Chainstack without block route and Chainstack with block route. But in terms of the time we received the response, Chainstack with block route is about 200 milliseconds faster in this scenario, which is pretty good in terms of the response time. And then let's take a look at the left-hand side. The transaction, uh, the compare transaction script just completed and uh, we have really good results here. Let's use the United States region as an example. So in this region, in this region, chain stack with blocks route is faster for 20 out of 20 transactions. And so the percentage is 100%. And the average time difference is 375 milliseconds. And similarly in the Europe region, chain stack with blocks route is also faster for 20 out of 20 transactions. So the percentage is 100% as well. And uh, the average time difference is 378 milliseconds. And then lastly, in the Asia Pacific region, we have a similar results. Chain stack with block trout is faster for 100% of transactions. And uh, we also have an uh, average time difference of about uh, 300 milliseconds. So that is a demo with 20 pairs of transactions. And because of the time constraint today, we were only able to complete a transaction propagation test with 20 pairs of transactions. However, in August, we also did a experiment with 200 pairs of transactions. And uh, there are some uh, results. So as we can see here, uh, the duration is like four minutes. While in the last test, it was only like 30 minutes to 30 seconds to one minute. So the transaction propagation test with 200 pairs takes more time. That's the reason why we are not doing that uh, in the live demo today. And uh, in that case, chain stack with block trout was faster for 200 out of 200 transactions. So the percentage is like 100%, which is uh, very good. And the average time difference was 296 milliseconds for this region, for the North America region. And then similarly for the Europe region, chain stack with block route was also faster for 200 out of 200 transactions. And uh, the average time difference was 303 milliseconds. Lastly, for the region in Asia, we have really similar results with the average time difference of 284 milliseconds. So in this case, I believe this demo illustrates the speed of chain stack with block route and the power of block routes blockchain distribution network. And uh, that's it for the demo. Thanks for listening.
Thank you so much, Carlo. That was very enlightening and very interesting. It's great to see good numbers uh, and, and to see live how the difference can be very palpable um, with the addition and the integration between Chainstack and Blockstrapped. Um, I would like to open the floor to questions um, and that's to everyone who was presented today, including for the demo. Um, if anyone has any question, please do feel free to either unmute yourself and ask the question directly or uh, to post it in the chat. And I know that we've been collecting a few questions uh, prior to the start of the webinar. Um, Brooke, you have some of them as well. Sure. Um, well, I can kick us off here and get the ball rolling for a question for uh, Professor Kuzmanovic. Um, one of the questions we received was, can you quantify the improvement a DeFi trader can expect in their trading strategy if they employ the BDN? Yes, basically, basically the last couple of slides from my, from my presentation were actually intended to do that. So this is basically, uh, uh, let me just share now my screen and then come here back to to actually do it so 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 i mean it's it's intuitive that using blocks route is is beneficial the question is how beneficial is it right and so on this particular case uh, we were trying to be very precise and very down to earth trying to to actually put a number on on this particular uh, uh, on 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 what we are bringing, right? So you saw like, hey, three hundred milliseconds, but then people can think like, well, I mean, is that how, how significant is three? Why do we care about three hundred milliseconds? I mean, it is better than two hundred and worse than four hundred, but how how why does it really matter? And basically, this model that I'm not gonna go through again. Is showing you that that uh, just in the Uniswap case, where we are only looking for the ten most popular uh, uh, pairs out there, uh, 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 basically fifty millisecond transaction difference translates to. Uh, I mean, it's really huge amounts of time, but this is really for a small number of those who are actually utilizing this. The way to actually understand how much does this help is to understand that every 300, 300 milliseconds helps, uh, gives you about 4%. In 40% of cases, you're going to be able to win over somebody else who isn't utilizing. And so while it may look like, hey, is 4% four, four uh, uh, big enough? Well, depends how much, if you are just trading uh, once uh, a month, then uh, uh, it will come short. However, if you are utilizing these services more often and, and if you're already starting to build a bot around this or are doing something uh, really, uh, uh, it really matters. And, and these percentages actually uh, translate to uh, uh, significant amounts of, of money that one can save or be more efficient uh, if they're using uh, this API. And I'm now uh, try to uh, unshare my uh, my thing. I, if somebody can help me with that, that would be even better. Stop share. Okay, there we are. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, we have another question from the chat. Um, what's the difference in using Blockstrout versus operating an Ethereum node with lots of public peers in high uptime? Let's just say for argument, a node up for weeks with 50 to 100 e-node peers. So, I mean, currently, if you're running an Ethereum node, you already are connected to, to this to the large number of nodes, right? But as I explained, once you send a transaction from that particular node, it goes through your peer-to-peer -peer network. So if these 50 nodes, 50 nodes or to whatever, 100 nodes, that's great, but then they have to send to their peers, they have to send to their peers and so on. And so it takes several cycles for your transaction to reach the mining pool. 
in, in the case of blocks route, once you connect out of 50 nodes, you just connect one of them to blocks route, okay? That gives you, a, you're, uh, you're connected within a single cycle to all mining poles that they are connected directly to us. So this is really giving you a significant boost. This is on one hand, and on the other hand, receiving nodes and transactions from others. So it depends how your peers are connected to, to, to these sources of information, which are transaction generators and block generators. Blocks route connects to all of them, and they all again are one cycle away from you, which means that you're going to hear about that in the first possible hop uh, uh, together with those who are connected to Blocks route. So the number of nodes that you're connected to matters, but what really matters is the quality, and Blocks route is indeed the best, uh, the best peer that you can uh, connect to. Uh, we are not saying that you shouldn't be connected to the rest of the world. Go on, uh, use them. But that one uh, uh, connection to Blocks route really gives you advantage. Yeah, I also want to uh, uh, contribute to this uh, answer from our perspective. And we actually are running Blocks route gateways for a few months already. And uh, uh, basically, you cannot get closer to your Ethereum node as a local here because you're actually running gateway usually in the same network uh, as you run your uh, your Ethereum node in, which means that you have a, a very stable local peer that is always with you. And that is something that you don't get when you're just syncing with the public network. Uh, and the, regardless, you have 50 or 100 peers, they are not closer than this local peer that sits uh, next to you in the same local network. So that's why you have this advantage of a few minutes uh, in our case that I, uh, that I showed uh, a little earlier, uh, because simply you have this trusted local peer that uh, gets all the blocks even actually even faster than uh, all the other nodes in the public network. So that's on the receiving side. Awesome. Uh, Eugene, I have a question for you. Um, it's regarding to Bolt. Um, they're asking us whether uh, Bolt, so if you could expand a bit more on what's the actual technology behind Bolt and whether it is just applied to Ethereum or if that's applicable to other blockchains as well. Well, as all great technologies, it's not very sophisticated. So it's, uh, it's an application of technology, right? You remember this one click uh, buy from Amazon. It's not very sophisticated technology, but it's, uh, it's great because of its simplicity. So Bolt is relatively simple. It's just um, basically maintaining a lot of different snapshots for all the different blockchain networks. And basically, it gives you the right snapshot at the right time. Um, so the technology can be generalized to any protocol because it's it's totally protocol agnostic so it's just the way how you basically serve the snapshots for your new workloads uh, uh, whenever you spin them up and uh, where we basically uh, excel this technology is we make it available in all uh, public cloud providers that we use uh, so we started with uh, google cloud and then we uh, we also uh, made it work in AWS and Azure, and we are uh, extending to other clouds as well. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, and, and we're gonna extend it to other protocols as well. Uh, today we support it, uh, we support Ethereum and Bitcoin uh, for Bolt. But again, if you have, let's say some kind of private network uh, that is very large or consortium network that is very large and you wanna sync the, uh, the other other side uh, on the other side of the world, you can um, exploit this technology as well. So it, it applies as 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 great as on public networks as well. Thank you. If uh, we don't have any more questions from the chat, I do have another question for um, Professor Kuzmanovich. Um, what has been Blockstrap's impact on Ethereum's uncle rate and what improvement can we expect to see in the future? Okay, so basically this has to do with like uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uncle rate is something that miners really care about because if you send two blocks nearly concurrently, then only one of them will make it to the blockchain. Now in Ethereum, that other block is also going to be rewarded, but uh, uh, much less. And hence, uh, uh, miners care about reducing the uncle rate because they really want to get to 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 get the real rewards. And then the underlying issue is if the network is really well synchronized. That means everybody has exactly the same information about what's happening with the rest of the network, then would, there wouldn't be any, any uncle rates because whichever block is mined first, then everybody else are gonna stop mining that block and gonna continue mining the other blocks. So naturally with blocks route, we significantly, dec uh, I mean, we affect the uncle rate because, because we are basically uh, syncing everybody much faster so that the, the, the uh, uh, that basically it doesn't happen that, that uh, there is a huge, uh, 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 that, that, that there is a huge uncle rate. So, uh, one thing, uh, uh, we believe we were not at the table when the miners were, uh, uh deciding this because they decide this, only those who hold the hash power can decide on how the block size is going to increase. However, there's been uh, uh, several instances in the last uh, six months when the, uh, 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 when the gas rate was increased in Ethereum by 25% in each of these instances. And we believe that we helped uh, shape that discussion a lot because the miners were kind of comfortable that once they're connected to blocks route, then they knew that uh, the, the, the uncle rate is not gonna, uh, is not gonna increase. And basically that's what happened. Uh, uh, Any time that, uh, uh, that uh, 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 the fees, uh, the basically the, the gas, the amount of gas in the block was increased, there was no statistically significant increase in the, in the uncle rate. And we argue that it's possible to, see, uh, to, to increase this gas fee much more significantly and that the uncle rate is gonna stay stable uh, because uh, we are helping uh, in that process. Of course, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, political discussions and, and many other things uh, happening in that discussion that influence it. But from the technical perspective, uh, we are confident that uh, increasing the gas fee uh, uh, is not gonna have any impact on uncle rates because we are pushing uh, data in the background and hence the, the, the uncle rate is not gonna skyrocket. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there any more last last questions uh, from the crowd or from the previously collected questions on, on our social channels? Brooke, any more on your side? I uh, just checking here. I think we had one last question. Um, yes, we do. How is, um, this one's for Professor Kuzmanovich. How is your confirmation probability service different from other fee estimation services? Okay, so that's a good one. This is something that we are working on currently. So basically this is, the, the other fee estimation services are giving you kind of a, longer time scale insights like, hey, if you, want your, if you want your transaction to make it to the block within the next some amount of time, then you, you should use this fee and so on and so forth. So what we are, uh, uh, what our, how our service is going to be different is that we are really aiming for, the, for those who worry about what happens within the next block, right? And so whoever sends us a transaction, they can, they can check in real time, the probability so that they can actually act quickly. And hence, we're really talking about much shorter time scales. And we are really aiming uh, this for those who worry about making sure the data transactions make it quite fast. It's not kind of like, hey, if you want it in the next five minutes or 20 minutes, this is what you do. Uh, that's what others are already, this space is covered and others are doing, uh, uh, doing uh, providing such a service. But what we really are, we are targeting the DeFi world where it really matters 
if your transactions make it to the next one. And so this is helping you understand whether you need to act quickly or not. So this is, it's more kind of a real time, uh, a real time service aimed for DeFi world. Uh, one more question. So, uh, with recent gas price uh, attacks, uh, on DeFi oracles, what would that mean for value add uh, of blocks route? I'd assume that developers can more quickly identify spam or detect attacks. Well, imagine that's for Professor Kuzmanovic. So this is pretty much related to what I was just uh, talking about. So we do have a fairly clean, uh, clean uh, transaction service, right? So what, uh, uh, which helps us kind of really understand what is going to be uh, mined in the next block, right? And hence, this really helps us uh, counter these types of like uh, Oracle attacks uh, the, that we've seen in the past, right? So, uh, uh, but again, this really is intended to, uh, not for the, uh, 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 this really is intended for the DeFi world where you really care about what happens uh, uh, in the next block in the, uh, or the block after that. So it's not a generic service where like, hey, uh, 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 you really want to uh, optimize your performance for later. But that said, our transaction service is something that can help you kind of uh, uh, counter these attacks as well, because we really are uh, sending a really clear and timely uh, uh, stream of, of, of transactions, which can also indirectly help you with such problems in case you're not uh, really into the DeFi and, and short time scale optimization. Awesome. Um, I think we are a, a bit ahead of time, uh, but it's good. I think everyone has been very efficient, <laughs> very regimental on the on keeping on time. And that, that has allowed us to, be, to have some space for questions. I have just one more last question, and that's for me personally. And that's for both Eugene and Professor Kuzmanovic. Um, now that the DeFi is exploding and there is a, a literal rush to find the next shiny thing. When it comes to sustainability and the development at six months from now, what do you think will be the applications uh, that will be, you know, lastly and producing value uh, for the entire industry and for the, for the finance, uh, for the financial markets uh, as a whole? Can you give a, a few examples? Uh, well, uh... Apart from this rush for uh, yield farming, I think the rest of the financial instruments are pretty much useful. So I personally a big fan of uh, protocols like DAI and Compound and a few others that actually give you real benefits if you are an end user, because you can actually um, like uh, uh, lend money in a very efficient fashion and a very permissionless fashion. and you can borrow money in the same fashion. So that's basic financial primitives that uh, are already working. I'm personally an active user as well because I really want to understand when I can give DeFi to my mom. So I really want to understand like when this moment will come so that she can download some app and she can do something useful. So I'm following stuff like uh, Dharma and also um, uh, things like crypto.com is not bad because they I give uh, uh, cryptocurrencies into the head, into the hands of uh, free users. And basically you can, let's say, issue a, a old fashioned credit card, but then you can use cryptocurrencies to pay. So I think these things are very, are very down to earth and they're very usable today. And uh, I think they exist already, which is great. Uh, we just need to uh, make sure it's uh, as usable um, for um, the next, um, hundreds of years, so that's my take. Awesome. I, I, I wouldn't add anything to that. I mean, Eugene just nailed it, so I don't wanna, I don't wanna say anything beyond that. Thank you.
<laughs> okay, awesome. I think we are all uh, closing on the same page and it's a nice wrap up. So uh, thank you everyone. I think it's been uh, an intense, um, useful informational session uh, for all of us. Uh, I definitely personally got a lot of knowledge uh, from both Eugene and Professor Kuzmanovic. Uh, Carlo did a, an amazing job at showing us in real terms what the numbers look like and what's the, the, concrete, um, the concrete takeaway from an integration of Blocks Route and Chainstack. Uh, but it's for everyone to now get you know, their hands on, uh, try it out, sign up for the console, um, try out with a, with a free uh, developer's account, and then you know, get started with building and innovating. Uh, I look forward to get everyone uh, in the community for both Blocks Route folks and for Chainstack folks, uh, everyone together. And there are a number of links that are uh, posted on the um, Eventbrite page. You can see all our Gitter, um, Discord, um, uh, Twitter channels. Please do, do come and say hi even after, uh, after this, this webinar. If you're watching this webinar as a recording, uh, there is time for you to just do exactly the same. And if you want to reach out to any of us, um, we are all available and, and always open. Just go to chainstack.com and to uh, blockstraps.com um, to learn more about the products and to try it out. Okay, I think this is a wrap for all of us. I thanks, uh, a big thank you to everyone. Thank you to all the attendees. Um, we will be sharing the recording uh, over the next 24 hours, Max. So keep your eyes peeled and you take care everyone. And thank you so much for being part of this, uh, this great event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye, everyone, bye.